as popular as the image of angels are, you know, not many people understand the truth about these supernatural messengers. Today on Through the Bible, we get an unusual peek into a part of God's creation that, well, we don't know much about. But Dr. J. Vernon McGee is our teacher, and this week, the Bible bus is taking us through the New Testament book of Jude. I'm Steve Schwetz, and before we jump into today's study, let's get caught up on how God's at work around the world through the ministry of Through the Bible. And I've got Greg with us. Greg, I love asking this question. Where's the world prayer team traveling this week? And I love to answer the question. And this week, our world prayer team warriors, over 10,000 people strong, are in Western Africa. And we're making our way through countries like Liberia, Ivory Coast, Nigeria, Benin, and Guinea-Bissau. And we're praying for the effectiveness of Through the Bible in the lives of people who speak languages like English, French, Yoruba, Fongbe, yeah. and Portuguese. Yeah. And those of you that know anything about Western Africa, you know it's a very difficult place. A lot of poverty, yes. a lot of oppression, human trafficking is an issue, AIDS mm-hmm. is an issue. There is just layer upon layer, huge influence of Islam and growing in that part of the world. And it is a dark place that desperately needs the gospel. And that's why we do what we do, Steve, because we know that all of these awful, sinful behaviors are really just manifestations of the deception and the lies of of Satan. And we want to bring the bright light of the Word of God into dark places like this. Yeah, let me read a, a, a listener letter from Fongby. I am very happy to be one of Through the Bible's listeners in Fongby. All the teachings helped me to face some big challenges in my life. Three weeks ago, my sister was seriously sick. Her tongue filled up her mouth and came out. The situation was declared untreatable in the hospital where she was admitted. Some while ago, I learned on this program that through Jesus, I can ask for healing. When we desperately left the hospital, we went to a prayer meeting. While praying, my elder sister and myself called unto the name of Jesus, asking for healing of our baby sister. And some hours later, her tongue became normal and her pain stopped. I am not only joyful for what happened, but also grateful to God for what he did that day. This miracle has been possible because of the truth I hear from you. And Steve, I love the fact that the balanced teaching of Dr. McGee, that we can pray for healing and God mm-hmm. has the power to heal. It's just that we don't control it and we we don't have some sort of healing power. Right. God has the healing power. And we get letters like this from around the world. Wonderful story. Here's another one from uh, our African English broadcast. I am a nurse in a hospital that is experiencing a financial crisis. I'm worried about what will happen to my patients if the hospital closes. I pray with them and even play your programs by their bedside. Hmm. I tell them that God is in control, but I still worry what will happen. Some of them have declared faith in Jesus Christ as a result. Please pray for their health and that the hospital will remain open. (laughs) Let me just point something out. If you love God's Word, if you're listening to this program, I know you do because you're listening to a five-year program on the Bible, but hopefully you also love God's people. If you're on the World Mm -hmm. Prayer Team, you've already shown that by signing up, and if your heart is moved by stories like this, testimonies like this, go and sign up today and join our World Prayer Team and faithfully pray for these folks. Go to ttb.org forward slash pray. I just wanted to plug that in there. And I love love your your passion for this, Steve. And, uh, you know, I I also want to throw my two cents in and say, if you're like most of us, you look at the news and it's all depression and it's it's gloom and doom. If you say, well, what can I do? Well, let me tell you something. You can join our world prayer team and it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with the power of God and the power of his word. You will touch people's lives all around the earth. Now, I think we have time for this one last letter. Yeah, let me read it. It's it's from our Portuguese African Uh, program. I am a single mother with five children. Two of my children live on the streets. Man, I give thanks to God because the three girls are safe at home studying despite many difficulties. We listen to Through the Bible Portuguese radio program every day, and it is the spiritual hub in our home. Thank you for the word of God. Please pray for us. And Steve, how many times do we hear letters about people that listen to Through the Bible around the breakfast table, around the dinner table? Mm -hmm. They listen as a family. I I just, again, like we were saying earlier, if you want to be part of something that's making an impact, real impact around the world and people's lives, please support us in prayer. Yeah, and if you want to be a part of the group that prays for the TTB family in Africa, especially the single mom, even if you're not on the World Prayer Team, set some time aside today to pray for them and for all of those listening in that part of the world. Greg, why don't you open us in prayer? 
Father, we see your power at work. We see your word moving in people's lives. And we know that it's all you and it's not us. We just want to be faithful servants. Would you please continue to use our efforts to get your word to people all across this planet? In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now we return back to the little book of Jude and we're in verse 6 today. Now he made it very clear that certain man had come in by the side door into the church among believers. And Jude says, I didn't write this. It's something new. Other writers had written about it. Peter wrote about it. Paul wrote about it, that these men were coming in and they had an outward appearance of being godly. They were ministers of Satan, but they looked like ministers of light. Inward, as Paul said, they were ravening wolves, but outside they acted like they were sheep, of course. And the test of the men finally came because they were turning the grace of our God into wantonness, that is, of arrogant sin and gross immorality. And they denied the Lord Jesus Christ. This was the mark. Now he gives instances of how God has judged in the past. And he gives, first of all, three groups of people. Later on, he's going to give us three individuals. But here are three groups. And we saw Israel last time. Because of unbelief, they could not enter the land. And they were judged. Now we find in verse 6 where we got to last time, Angels rebelled, and they're kept in chain, and God will also judge them. Now, I want to read again today this verse, and the angels who kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Now, May I say that the judgment of angels here is something that is not new either. It is something that had been mentioned before. But before I get into that, I would like to say just a word relative to the fact of angels. Now, for a long time, the church was denying the supernatural denied that there were any such creatures at all. Actually, many ministers denied that. We're living in a materialistic age, and the viewpoint was that we were going to get rid of God altogether, that we didn't need him. And certainly, the idea of angels is just a superstition. And it was Huxley who said that the belief in God was like the fading smile of a Cheshire cat that it was disappearing in this scientific age. And back in 1963, Ben Heck wrote, and I'm going to give you just an excerpt from a little article he wrote on the new God for the space age. Will you listen to just these first few paragraphs here? He says, The most amazing event to enter modern history has been generally snubbed by our chroniclers. It is the petering out of Christianity. Not only are the Bible stories going by the board, but a deeper side of religion seems to be exiting. This is the mystic concept of the human soul and its survival after death. Parsons are still preaching away on this topic, and congregations are still listening. But congregation and parson both seem to move from church to museum. Fifty years ago, religion was an exuberant part of our world. Its sermons, bazaars, tag days, taboos, and exhortations filled the press. Its rituals brought a glow to our citizenry. At their supper tables, a large part of the voting population bowed its head and said grace. Religion today is a touchy subject, not because people believe deeply and are ready to defend such belief with emotion, but because they do not want to hear it discussed. 
They do not know quite how they feel, and they do not know what to say about God, his angels, and the record of his miracles, not wanting to sound anti-Christian or anti-social or anti-anything, not under general condemnation. They settle for silence. In this silence, more than in all the previous agnostic hullabaloo's religion seems swiftly disappearing. Now, that was back in 1963, and if Ben Heck was here today, he'd note that there's been a tremendous revival. Now, liberalism has been predicting for years the death knell of the church and of that, of course, which is supernatural. Now, I could quote you ad nauseum what liberals said a few years ago. For instance, one man at the Chicago Theological Seminary made the statement that Protestantism has gotten so prosperous statistically that it has lost all internal discipline whatsoever. It looks frightfully confining from the outside, but on the inside it has no discipline, no integrity. Now that was the picture they gave, and of course it's the picture of the liberal church. And by the way, it certainly has almost gone by the board. But today there's been a revival of that which is the supernatural. And it's quite interesting that the revival didn't come in a church. It didn't come even among the fundamentalists. It came on the campuses of some of the colleges, and especially the campuses of some colleges that a few years ago that were blatantly materialistic and denied anything of the supernatural at all. Now today, they're talking about demonism, and they're talking about Satan, and they actually are talking about God and the Bible, so that the supernatural all of a sudden has appeared again, and angels today seem to make sense even in a space age. And so in this day, men and women are concerned as they look about at a world of materialism that has gone crazy. We know how to get to the moon, but we do not know how to control human nature down here on this earth. And one of the great problems is taking place right here in Southern California. A paper that's a reputable paper here in Southern California came out with the fact that Los Angeles is becoming an armed city because of the gangs that roam the streets. And they are free to roam the streets, the article said. And good people, that is law-abiding people, are in prison in their homes, afraid to venture out. And Los Angeles is an armed camp. May I say to you, the thing that happened a few years ago was in this materialistic age, we said human nature's gotten better. It's been improved, and we don't need all of these laws. And the lid was taken off. And my friend, we found out, instead of it being a bucket of perfume, it just happened to be a bucket of slop, a bucket of filth, a bucket of garbage, and the vile and unspeakable crimes that have been committed, unbelievable immorality has taken place. And the questions being asked, where does all this vileness, where does all this evil come from? And so they need the devil. As somebody has put it, if there wasn't the devil, man would have to invent one to explain all the evil that's in the world today. In other words, humanity is depraved. You and I don't seem to realize that we belong to a race that's totally depraved. And in a world under the control of Satan today. And we think that by removing all the laws and restraints, which have been, that we would produce a wonderful free society. Well, instead of that, men now are returning back actually to the supernatural. And unfortunately, the great emphasis has been upon evil spirits because they have to have something to explain them. Well, the Bible has something to say about it. Bible, you see, is very much up to date, friends. And here in the sixth verse, we have a remarkable statement. 
and the angels who kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. Now, the Word of God has a great deal to say about the judgment that is coming upon this earth. And friends, instead of there going to be one judgment day, that is rather naive. And of course, those without a knowledge of the Bible talk about a big judgment day, the great judgment day. Well, the great white throne judgment is coming in the future for the unsaved, but there are actually eight judgments that are mentioned in the Word of God. And one of those judgments is the judgment of angels. And that judgment, of course, will take place sometime during the kingdom reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a passage over in 1 Corinthians 15, 24, and I want to turn there and read. He says here, he gives the order of the resurrection, Christ the first roots, and afterward they that are Christ that is coming. Now, verse 24, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule, all authority, and all power. That is, this evil power, the demonic forces that are in the world. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. So during the millennium, these demonic powers will be judged. And then the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now, the scripture has a great deal to say about this judgment of angels. And I'd like to turn to several passages that refer to it. Over in 1 Corinthians 6, 3, we are told, Know ye not that we shall judge angels, how much more things that pertain to this life. Now, that's something I wouldn't have known if Paul hadn't told us that we are going to have part in that, and I think it'll be during the millennial reign of Christ on earth when we are with him as believers, and I think that he'll commute back and forth to the new Jerusalem, where the church is. That'll be the eternal home of the church. And so, during that time, there will be a judgment of angels. Though we're created lower than they are, someday we will have part in the judgment of them. Now, in 2 Peter 2, 4, we have another reference here that corresponds to that of Jude. For if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell, and the word hell here actually, of course, means Hades. It's the place of the unsaved, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved under judgment. Now, that leads me to make this statement here concerning our passage here that says that they are reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgment of the great day. Now, if you think that this has reference to chains that has links in it, then forget it, because these angels are spiritual creatures, and it'd be pretty difficult to put a chain on one of them. The word is bonds. Actually, they're going to be, frankly, heavily guarded. And again, I'm going to turn to Dr. Weiss's translation that he's given. He says, and angels who did not carefully guard their original position of preeminent dignity, but abandoned once for all their own private dwelling place with a view to the judgment of the great day in everlasting bonds under darkness, he has put under careful guard. Now, this company of angels are awaiting a judgment that apparently will come during the kingdom age. Now, another group of these fallen angels are the demons that are abroad today in the world. And demonic power, of course, is a reality. But may I say that all of this emphasis today, it's being overplayed, and actually there's not near the manifestation of demonic power at present as we're led to believe. All of this thing has been built up to a very high pitch, but the fact is that if 90% of it is phony, and I think that a good percentage is phony, 
What about the other 10% or how much ever it is? You're sure going to have trouble explaining that away. And that's the reason that that play, The Exorcist, got under the skin of so many people, is that here was an example of the forces of evil that are in the world. And that was nothing in the world but a movie, and there's no reason for you to go there and faint because all you're doing is to seeing actors act. That's all that is. But the thing is, it's based upon a factual case, one that actually took place. And there are cases like that, but there's not near as much as a great many people are led to believe. And again, may I say that there are other references. Here in Jude, we have this reference. And then over in the 20th chapter of Revelation at verse 10, it says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, this is a reference to actually hell. It's the lake of fire. And now, if you want to argue literal fire, all right. But it's more literal than fire, and it's worse than fire. Fire is a very weak symbol for how terrible it's going to be. After all, these are spiritual beings here that are mentioned, and the devil doesn't get there first. Great many people think the devil is in hell today. Instead of that, he's very busy in Los Angeles. Probably he's busy in your town, and he has quite a few helpers, both supernatural and natural. There are a lot of folk that are helping him out today. Now, there is coming a time when this creature is going to be put out. We're told over in the 12th chapter of Revelation at verse 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevail not, neither was there any place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, and his angels were cast out with him, so that the earth is to be cleansed of this crew that's been abroad in the earth for a long time, and they are to be judged. Now, they are to be judged because of the fact that sometime in the past, Probably in a pre-Adamic age, there was a rebellion on the part of the angels against God. Now, I'm just hitting this lightly, because when we get to the book of Revelation, we'll be dealing in detail with many of these great truths that are here. So, I'm going to pass along now to the next that is mentioned here, and that's in verse 7, and I'll read our authorized version. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, these cities were judged, so much so that they probably are buried there today beneath the Dead Sea. It's the belief today that they've located them. I do not know whether they have or not. I'm not sure that that's too important for the child of God, but it was their defiled flesh. They were given over to homosexuality. Of course, that's sodomy, but that's called homosexuality today, and adultery has been changed to free love, and the drunkard is a respected alcoholic, and the murderer is temporarily insane, and Satan is doing a good job today indoctrinating the world with a new vocabulary. But may I say to you, this was the vilest sin of all, gross immorality. They sometimes call it the new morality, but it goes back to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, God has judged men in the past for the sins in sensuality, and it's a warning. All this is given to us as a warning that God will judge any civilization. doesn't make any difference what it is that goes too far in this direction. And we're sure moving in that direction today. Now we leave off there. Next time we'll pick up at verse 8. 
And not until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Tomorrow, our expedition through God's Word continues. Until then, if you'd like to find a Bible study resource by Dr. McGee to read or listen to yourself, then visit ttb.org or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. I'm Steve Schwetz, wishing you God's best as you faithfully walk with Him. Jesus made it all, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. We're grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners, whom God uses to take the whole word to the whole world.